directors of the Clinical Education and Innovation Department here at McSilver and also with CTAC. We're really excited to talk with you today. Um, our topic today is helping the helpers occupational stress and self-care. So Lydia and I are really fortunate to, to do a lot of consultation with clinics. And one of the things that we hear time and time again or observe is a real challenge around self-care and the difficult, difficult work that we're all doing and how sometimes we're, we're the last people that we take care of. And so as a result, we wanted to share some of, of our information with you. Um, and, and so today's webinar is going to be even enhance more with your participation. We have a lot of information to share with you. We're going to have a lot of resources that will be up on the CTAC website after today. Um, but please feel free to chime in and chat in any questions you have, any comments you have, because this is for you. We really want you to get a lot out of today's webinar. This is an overview of what we're going to do. And I just wanted to jump in, welcome everybody, this is Lydia Franco, that this is part one of a two-part series on workforce resilience. And as Kara had said, um, she and I have been doing consultations with agencies and, and, and clinicians as well now for a number of years, and we do see this common theme around really not being able to find time to take care of ourselves, to attend to some of these issues of burnout, especially now in this sort of changing healthcare environment and the importance of doing that um, as things not just in dealing with a number of complex cases and, and the work that we're doing with our clients, but also as things may be changing within your own workplace. So it's really important to kind of think about ourselves, building some personal resilience, but also thinking about workplace support and, and creating a more um, supportive environment. So today's webinar is really going to focus on self-care and managing your workload. Um, our second webinar is in September, and that's really going to be focused on enhancing um, supervision and really creating a supportive environment across staff. So here's our agenda today. You could, as you can see, it's pretty packed. We're going to do a little overview. Uh, talk about the roles of stress, compassion satisfaction, compassion fatigue, burnout, and secondary trauma. We're going to talk about the importance of the self-assessment, building resilience. As Lydia mentioned, we're really focused on building resilience today and thinking about practical ways of coping, personal ways, uh, personal relationships, workplace relationships, and then uh, think about resiliency, resiliency planning, and then we'll have some, hopefully a few minutes for some Q&A time. So I just wanted to highlight, especially if you're new to some of our webinars, is that everybody is currently muted. Um, so you'll be primarily hearing Kara and myself. However, you have a chat box on the right-hand side in that panel in which we encourage you to share your thoughts, your comments, your experiences in that chat, uh, and we'll be able to, to announce those and include them or answer any questions that you have as we walk through the webinar today. We'll also have some time at the end to answer some questions. And there will also be a couple times where we'll be asking you some specific um, ideas, uh, recommendations, situations, scenarios that you've experienced where you've uh, been dealing with some stressful events that, uh, in your work. So please feel free to use that chat. And when you type in that blank box, make sure to check the drop down and click send to all panelists. That way that we can see uh, what your responses are. There's also going to be one polling question um, that will pop up. So hopefully you can participate in that as well. So here we are. This, this, this is me before work, or this is you or a friend of yours. Um, and then maybe this is what you look like after work. If you can relate to this, will you just press uh, write in yes in the chat box? I wanted to see how many people kind of relate to this image. Here's before work and then after work. It looks like a few people are, are, are saying that they can um, relate to this. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> All caps and multiple <laughs> exclamation points, yes. I'm not, that, I'm not that frazzled, just tired, so maybe a little bit like that sometimes. Thank you, guys. Excellent. We want to start talking with you about stress. So I'm, I'm sure you guys think about stress, feel stress have definitions of stress. This is kind of our baseline that we're working with today. So there are at least three different kinds of stress, and all of which carry physical and mental health risks. The biggest thing about stress that I want, and I know you know this, but just to reiterate, 
that there is, it, it, stress is compounded, right? So if I get up in the morning and I go to get my subway or, or drive and there's an accident and so I can't get to where I'm going and I'm, I'm starting to feel a little stressed and I get to where I'm going and there's some crisis and I'm feeling a little more stressed and then I get a phone call and my uh, a family member's not doing well and that's a little more stressed. So there's this, stress is really compounded. So we just want to be mindful of that because there are ways that we can intervene around when we experience one type of stress, how we can intervene, intervene with self-care and think about it. But to talk about the three different types of stress, there's this routine stress we all experience that related to pressures of work, family, and other responsibilities that we have. Then there's stress brought, brought on by a sudden negative change, for example, an illness, divorce, losing a job. And then there's traumatic stress which is experienced in a big event like a major uh, accident or assault, war, natural disaster. So this is where one may be seriously hurt or in danger of being killed, where your safety is really, really in question. So these are the, the, the different types of stress that we're thinking about today. And they all have implications. They all have uh, effects on our health, both, both physical, uh, but also our mental health. And, and something um, that I think we can um, – we can maybe start off with just thinking about this idea of chronic stress. This idea is that especially if we're experiencing stress in the workplace, this is something we go to on a daily basis. This is something that we, um, you know, experience on a regular level. So what we did is we kind of see kind of what is it, what is sort of the current research or surveys on stress in the workplace in particular, and, and what does that mean, or what is the effect of stress in general? Um, and, and one thing that we found from some of the studies that we came across was that really most of Americans really report feeling moderate to high stress levels. Um, many of our visits to doctors are oftentimes stress-induced uh, or stress-related or stress-induced illnesses. So, for example, um, there were some that were saying there was as much as 70 to 80 percent of all visits to the doctor was, was related to stress in some way. And that many of the physical problems that we start to experience is really either um, a direct effect of stress or just contributed or exasperated by, by stress. So, for example, things like headaches and high blood pressure and heart problems, diabetes, skin conditions, asthma, arthritis, depression, anxiety, and on and on and on. Um, I know many of you um, are, are also um, social workers, probably not everybody, but we're all definitely in the helping profession. So I think this probably applies across a uh, type of profession. And some of the kind of research that's being done now around stress and and social workers and burnout was um, basically saying that generally, and especially across the helping professions, um, that most of us find this work to be really deeply satisfying. It can be very rewarding. We enjoy the work. We started doing this this kind of work because we really wanted to help people and, and really try to find ways to alleviate and improve um, uh, functioning and support uh, people in our community. Um, but that, you know, studies have found that social workers have higher levels of stress and burnout than workers in other occupations. This idea that, you know, the, by the nature of the type of work that social workers in particular have, that they're, we're going to experience high levels of stress um, um, and potentially burnout as well. So one key thing to consider there is what is it that we're doing for ourselves? What is it that we're doing in our workplace? If we know um, from, from what's already out there, that this is going to be a potentially stress-inducing job. Um, and there was this uh, study done out of California, which is also interesting, that looked at sort of the physical health effects of um, specific to social workers. And what they found is that when social workers started feeling higher levels of burnout, they also found um, some significant physical health issues, specifically around GI issues, gastrointestinal issues, headaches, and respiratory infections. So you ended up getting sick more often. You ended up taking time off. So what we're really talking about is something that is important not just for our own self-care, taking care of ourselves and making sure that we're healthy and we're healthy for our families, but also in terms of a, a, a workplace and an organization, and if there's supervisors or administrators on the webinar as well, is really thinking through, if we know if this is what the literature is saying, what are some things we can start doing right away to help alleviate some of these common issues? And the thing to point out is that it's also common for the type of work that we do. So we wanted to take a moment and just um, kind of ask you, what are some of the, give us some examples of a way that work stress has affected you. What, what um, you know, not without getting into too much detail, what has happened? What were some signs that you were affected by, by the stress, physical or emotional? How did you know that the work that you were doing started to affect mm -hmm. you? So again, use that chat box on the right-hand side, click send to all panelists and, and submit. And someone has said headaches, so you experienced some headaches. Those are some signs. 
Anyone else? Others were talking about maybe getting colds more often, mm -hmm. um, migraines, mm -hmm. big ones. Um, Fatigue, bad but, attitude. Having dream, vivid dreams uh, that are representing your work and your stress. Excellent. Yeah, and I, and I have to say that a lot of the things that are coming, anxiety about going to work, um, really beginning to see the burnout, the respiratory problems, the fatigue, chronic anger, overeating, exhaustion, sarcasm, mm -hmm. lack of sleep, um, mm -hmm. headaches, really. So I guess we really are, mm -hmm. are corroborating the research that's out there. Headaches keep popping up. Um, insomnia or disrupted sleep. Um, so the, the, and what I want to say is when Karen and I have also done this, uh, this work before with others, this presentation before, we've found similar things in other settings. So social workers and non-mental health settings, we've also found, whether in, in sort of just general community settings and, and, and also in health settings, a lot of the same issues were popping up, mm -hmm. that people were really experiencing a lot of these mm -hmm. um, same concerns. So thank you. And I guess, and please keep submitting, we're getting a lot of responses in. Also let us know, um, you know, were there any other, any things that really kind of let you know besides sort of the headaches? How, what were some triggers or, or things that you knew, uh-oh, something's really coming on? Just keep submitting that um, um, and, and let us know. Again, more weight gain, disruptive, disruptive sleep, anger, frustration. Thank, Thank you, you for sharing. Um, and please keep submitting those to the chat box. So in, in really kind of thinking through how to attend to some of these issues around stress and burnout, and we're, we were kind of exploring what are some, some ideas that are currently out there. Um, and we really like this one model called professional quality of life, which is really think, and was particularly um, uh, developed and tailored for those in the helping professions. And this one really identifies sort of that difference between compassion satisfaction and sort of the ideal of, of the work that we're experiencing when we're working with others, but also this other side of compassion fatigue. And within that, there's these concerns around burnout as well as secondary trauma. And um, compassion satisfaction is really sort of that positive aspect of, of, of working as a helper, this idea of, you know, the, the, that you feel that the work is rewarding, you're generally happy, you're, you're, you're not as um, stressed, stressed by the work, you're really kind of feeling um, good about the work that you're doing. Compassion fatigue is where you really still appreciate the work, but you're starting to experience some of these negative aspects. And then some, a couple two more serious um, aspects of compassion fatigue would be burnout, which I think some of you already kind of wrote in saying that you're either experiencing that or seeing others with that. Um, so really starting to really feel overwhelmed and uh, truly, truly exhausted and that you feel it's not, nothing's helping anymore, that you're really just not being effective. And then work-related traumatic stress. So some of you have written in around having vivid dreams and, and things like that. And, and sometimes those are also signs and symbols of um, sort of secondary trauma um, from hearing experiences from people. So we're going to talk a little bit about each of these, uh, but we're also then going to focus quite a bit of our time in our webinar on how to alleviate some of these things. Mm -hmm. What can we do to keep, take control of the work and take control of our lives and take better care of ourselves? Mm -hmm. So let's talk with, start with compassion satisfaction. So if you can think about maybe the first week of work when you first started way back when or a couple years ago or whenever it was, um, this is probably how you felt. So you really feel satisfied. You were excited about work. You enjoyed it. You feel positive toward clients. And, and some of you may still feel this way. This is compassion satisfaction. You're able to keep up with the work and the demands, and you feel like you're helping each other, helping others, so that you're feeling like you make a difference. So this is compassion satisfaction. And then sometimes this begins to happen, what we call compassion fatigue. Um, what I want to say is that compassion fatigue really affects those of us that do our work well. Because this is not like other professions. This profession is where we use ourself, we are invested in, emotionally invested in our clients. We're emotionally invested in, in our agencies. Um, this is a profession where we're using ourselves and everything about ourselves. So compassion fatigue can set in, and which looks like a shift in hope and optimism. So starting to feel a little, a little bad. Uh, maybe some of those bad attitudes come up. Uh, deep physical exhaustion, that fatigue starts to come up. Um, practitioners continue to give themselves fully, but it's difficult to maintain a healthy balance. So you may be, get, be doing your work really well, but feeling uh, pretty tired and headachy afterwards. It can be a typical response to work overload, so the flows and uh, the ebbs and flows of the demands. Um, and there are these two components. But I wanted to back up just for a minute to show you this little guy um, that 
I, maybe we can all relate to, I know I can, where he's, he's really excited and he's saying, save the tiger, save the whale, save the seal, save the gorilla, save the elephant, save the honeybees, and then he falls over and his friend just sits, just sits there on that stu in his bucket and he says, yeah, compassion fatigue, and he says, I know. And so this is what happens. We're so excited and, and, and experience, all the experiences that we have some, can sometimes lead to compassion fatigue. But thinking about these two components, uh, which are burnout and secondary trauma, is what Lydia is going to talk about. And the one thing I wanted to add about compassion fatigue is that it can fluctuate depending on sort of the, the workload. So maybe you have periods of time where you're feeling really feeling overwhelmed, and then you you start feeling some of that those fatigue kind of symptoms. But then you move, and then maybe things kind of clear up, and then you're feeling a little bit better. Compassion fatigue necessarily isn't a, a constant state, but can really um, fluctuate and change. Um, now, the, the other sort of more serious side of compassion fatigue is, is this idea of burnout. And I think all of us can really identify these people. We've seen them. Maybe we work alongside of them. Maybe it's some of us are also experiencing some of these issues of burnout. But burnout is really sort of, you know, when you really start feeling kind of hopeless, um, you're, you're truly exhausted and overextended by the work, depersonalization. So that's when we, and I think somebody had typed in sort of, you start feeling cynical. You know, when you see that person who's cynical all the time about their clients or about clients, whether whether clients can really kind of uh, have better outcomes or not, and you start really seeing some of that blaming attitude and, and, and some of those kind of really negative uh, responses, sometimes that severe sarcasm, which it really borders on the cynicism as well, um, kind of comes up. Um, uh, diminished personal accomplishment. So this is where you just start don't start feeling very effective anymore. You um, you you don't feel that you're um, that successful in the work that you're doing and in helping the clients. And maybe you feel like you're less not just less confident but also less competent in, in the work that you're doing. This is sort of the perception of the worker. And oftentimes I will say that this isn't just about the individual. Oftentimes these experiences are really tied to the workplace environment, the really high workloads and non-supportive work environment in particular. So whether or not the workload is high, I think the key piece there is that if whether you feel supported or not in the work that you're doing, whether you feel you have control over the work that you're doing in some way, whether that work is really satisfying or not. And all those, the answer is no to many of those, all of those may be potentially contributing to these symptoms of, of uh, burnout. I think one important question to consider, which I, I, which I thought was really helpful, is to ask yourself, do I love my work? Right? Do you love your work? If the answer is no, it is most likely that you're suffering from burnout. Really, you you know, you're really at the point where you're just you. It's that really what you see here is that feeling of hopelessness, the exhaustion, the depersonalization, cynicism. You no longer enjoy the work that you do. If you say, do, if you ask yourself, do I love my work? And the answer is yes then you're more likely suffering from compassion fatigue. It's some, it's, you're, you're tired, you're, you may be stressed out, you may be having some of these symptoms, but that you still enjoy the work that you do, then maybe that's a time of compassion fatigue. And a key indicator is that maybe you need some time out or some time to really just take care of yourself. Another one that we won't go too deeply into, um, but it looked like from some of the responses that we got is that some of you may also be, may be experiencing some of these things, which is secondary traumatic stress. And this idea is that, you know, as clinicians, we're constantly hearing really intense stories, um, the client's personal traumas and trauma histories and a variety of different things over and over and over again. And some of those instances, for some of us, could trigger a, a, a sort of a, 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 a traumatic response or traumatic stress. And it may not be quite PTSD, um, but similar. And this idea is that you may start feeling afraid, you start really having difficulty sleeping, images of upsetting events, so maybe the story that you heard, you start kind of seeing that, you start having um, nightmares, maybe you want to avoid the client, or you start getting, rem or you want to avoid the reminders of any of the events. So some of us are in positions in which we may experience primary traumatic stress, where we're directly exposed to a traumatic incident, especially if we work in mobile crisis, or we work in, in um, emergency situations, we may experience primary traumatic stress because you're directly experiencing that trauma. But there's also secondary traumatic stress when you're hearing stories of trauma experienced by your clients over and over again, that for some of us, and I can say that this is, it, doesn't, it happens enough 
where it's an indicator that maybe it means that we need to take some time for ourselves and maybe seek some of our own counseling. And a key thing here is that it has a tendency to have a rapid onset um, specific to a particular event. So maybe you just heard a traumatic uh, story or you're working very closely with a client and soon after that is when you start experiencing some of these symptoms. So if you are having some of this, we encourage you to seek some of your own kind of counseling, some of your own help, and really talk to your supervisors about some of these um, concerns as well. We want to take a minute to just do some reflection, some reflection and self-assessment. Where are you? This is a, a compassion fatigue self-assessment. It's very brief. It's not validated, um, but it's something that we can do together right now. So answer these questions, yes or no. Personal concerns commonly intrude on my professional role, yes or no. My colleagues seem to lack understanding. I find even small changes enormously draining. I can't seem to recover quickly after association with trauma. Association with trauma affects me very deeply. Number six, my patient's stress affects me deeply. Number seven, I have lost my sense of hopefulness. I feel vulnerable all the time. And number nine, I feel overwhelmed by unfinished personal business. So just take a minute and see how many of these out of nine are you experiencing. And then we're going to um, put, bring up a poll. We have a little polling, and we're going to see how you responded. So, so um, just take a, a few seconds, read through those questions, and quickly say kind of yes or no. And then once you've tallied that up, go to the poll on the right-hand side. It should have popped up. And let us know how many of those you said yes to. And then we'll just give everybody, there'll probably be a slight delay in getting all that information in. So we'll, and then we'll see kind of where everybody is at. So A is if you responded yes to one item, B is if you responded to two items, C is if you responded to three items, and D is if you responded yes, yes. to four or more items. So take a minute and just let us know where you are with this assessment. Okay, so and as soon as we have enough of those responses, we can pull up um, we can pull up uh, the results. All right, so we can probably pull up that, those poll results now. And for those of you um, who, so the, the thinking here is if it's just one or two or three items, chances are that's pretty normal. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, many of you said yes to one, a couple of you yes to two. There were a few of you who didn't get to answer, but there was also a few of you that were said yes to four or more. And the key thing here is to really think through um, when it's yes to four or more, then it's possible that you may want, you may be experiencing some of the indicators of compassion fatigue. And um, I think we were on a webinar once uh, where we did this with another group, and they were pretty close to all of them. Mm -hmm. um, so that and so, so that individual was probably much closer to burnout. So what this this is really utilized as an exercise. Um, towards the end of the webinar, we're going to um, send you. So we're going to have some handouts that you'll have available on the CTACNY.com website, and also a, a scale that I think is very good at assessing compassion fatigue. Um, and uh, burnout and compassion satisfaction as well that you can utilize and kind of take through and walk through yourself or utilize maybe in staff meetings or with your supervisor and talk through some of those concerns and, and issues. So we recommend using those skills that we'll talk about a little bit later. Thank you everybody for participating, that was great. So what is the key here? And the key here is, you know, the idea is how do we go from compassion fatigue back to compassion satisfaction or how do we maintain compassion, satisfaction. And the key here is what we're really talking about is self-care and the importance of self-care. And that really has to become a priority and a necessity, not a luxury in the work that we do. And I think Kara and I are guilty of this. I think I'll oh, speak for you, Kara. I think we're guilty of this ourselves, <laughs> as well as something that we hear pretty often is, well, I don't have time for that right now. I don't have time to um, take lunch away from my desk, or I don't have time to um, exercise, or I don't have time to do different things to really kind of take care of myself. I'm just too busy. 
And it's usually the first thing that kind of falls off the to-do list or it just keeps getting carried over day to day to day to day. And I, and, and I think what's helpful for Karen and myself in doing some of this, and, and I want you to think about as, as we go through and start talking, is that we also are a good check for each other. We work pretty closely. So if we haven't eaten lunch, if one of us hasn't eaten lunch mm -hmm. or something, we say, hey, you know, what's going on? What haven't you eaten lunch? Or let's go get some lunch. So we try to be a check for each other, um, which is an important sort of support system. Um, but really just that making it a priority is particularly important. Now, many of you talked uh, earlier in our presentation around some uh, symptoms that you're having around stress, some real issues. What are some things that has worked for you to relieve the work stress? What are some things that you're doing that you think has helped kind of alleviate some of the, those um, triggers, those things that start the headaches and the fatigue and the, and the um, frustration? What are some things that work for you? If you can chat those in. Again, on the right-hand side, and click send to all panelists. Great music. Ruth says music, yoga, and and Latasha had mentioned earlier that she now has a balance. She used to take stuff home with her, but is really not doing that anymore. The emotional boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> spending time with loved ones, connection to faith community, excellent. Exercising, spending time with family and friends, so those relationships. We're going to talk a little more about that. Exercising, talking with others, that social support system is particularly important. Meditation and prayer, sort of really tapping into spirituality is particularly helpful for many. Um, uh, you know, having lunch together, um, Zumba, that's also mm -hmm. very popular one. So really kind of taking that time to exercise. Some of us also watch TV or sports, um, really trying to find hobbies. Um, spending time with friends, and I think I think those are all exactly some of the things that are important to do personally and individually. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes, if, why don't you type in to us and let us know what are some challenges in doing those on a consistent basis, because that's also something we like to hear. Um, what are some challenges um, that get in the way of you being able to exercise regularly or of, of getting that massage or of listening to music or talking or mm -hmm. hanging out with friends. Time. Um, time and, then, and money that, that people are typing in. Mm -hmm. Time and money. And and over and over again, people are saying time and money. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, the barrier to exercise is working too much, and I think that's <laughs> actually pretty – um, true. Mm -hmm. um, so over and over again, what we see here is obviously there's some issues around money and whether we can afford to do some of these things, but there are also things that we mm -hmm. can also do to uh, that are free or low cost. But at the same time, it's time and time management and that it is oftentimes the first mm -hmm. thing that gets knocked out. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you so much for responding. This was really great to hear from everyone. <coughs> Excuse me. So Another main area, so what we want to do now is now that we've identified a number of stressors for you, things that are key indicators for you that you're really stressed out, is really thinking through this idea of resilience. <clears throat> and a recent study um, that was done, uh, actually there's quite a bit of work coming out on this through um, the UK, and um, they really started looking at what makes resilient social workers in particular, but I think this applies across the helping professions um, and, and all mental health um, counselors as well is that there's some key sort of um, uh, skills and strategies that are utilized by very resilient social workers. And these are some of them here. So this idea of being able to have that work-life balance and finding that time to be able to do that. Reflective skills, sort of that really that, that key to self-awareness, uh, being mindful of the work that we're doing and how we're doing it. Being flexible in our coping styles, adapting pretty quickly to changes and, and to things that are going on. Um, one of you also uh, kept writing in around sort of those emotional boundaries. So being able to be empathic um, without over-involvement, without becoming too distressed by the work and, and figuring out what those emotional boundaries are. Um, strong social support networks. Many of you said spending time with friends or hanging out with friends or family. Um, so really thinking through what are those social support networks, and I encourage you to think through what are they at work as well as at home. And social confidence, and, and I think some of that is really tapping into the ability to be able to be um, skilled in communicating and in relationship building, whether professionally or personally. And we're going to talk a little bit about each of these and how we some strategies and some ideas around enhancing some of these or at least assessing them for you. Um, but please continue to write in some additional suggestions or things that have worked for you. And, you know, the easiest one, and I think this is the one that everybody does, whenever you go to a self-care presentation or workshop, it's always about 
you know, make sure you take time for yourself to listen to music and exercise, eat better. Those are the common suggestions, right? But oftentimes they, it, they work to a point, but then it's difficult to really implement. Now, we do encourage to, uh, to be able to do some of those things, but we also acknowledge that, you know, we, we tend to experience stress differently. Um, what may be, for example, what may be stressful to Kara and some of the work that we do, I may not find it stressful and vice versa. We all react to things differently, but that the strength in the work that we do really comes in identifying what that stress is and how to act to manage it. Um, ideally, how do we can prevent it from escalating to a point that it becomes unmanageable, but also then once we start feeling it, how can we reduce it? How can we manage it and alleviate it? Um, and a key thing there is probably something we recommend our clients do on a regular basis as well, is checking in, doing a self-assessment. What is your stress level on a daily basis? Um, you know, there are things like a stress thermometer, or think of a pain scale, zero to 10. You can turn that into a stress scale, zero to 10, 10 being very stressed. Where are you today? Um, and if you're probably at a five or more there, then there's probably maybe some things that can be instituted to help you kind of begin to alleviate that before it becomes a 10 or worth of 15, <laughs> really getting off the scale. So really taking that time to think about these self-assessments, and we have a couple that we're going to talk to you a little bit about as well. But I also wanted to attend, is in addition to just sort of self-assessment and general stress, is, is there anything in our own personal history? Do we have a personal history of trauma that is also potentially contributing to this? Um, and we found that that is also very common. So oftentimes there are um, we, we as social workers, clinicians, mental health counselors, or psychologists, many of us also may have experienced our own trauma. And what are those triggers? Have, have those um, past trauma histories been uh, addressed in some way? Have you sought help? How are you dealing and coping with some of those um, experiences? Because oftentimes if many of that has gone unaddressed, adding the work stress or hearing client stories or what have you is just going to continue to trigger some of those stress responses for you. Um, so the idea here is really being self-aware around that um, and how can we attend to and, and, and address those issues before they get out of hand. And again, this is just the personal self-care yeah. aspect. Of so these are some areas to examine. Um, sleep. I was actually reading this morning uh, an article around the problems and the deep exhaustion that new parents feel and that maybe it's not well attended to. So if any of you are parents out there as well, um, you may already be sleep deprived and then if this work is, is interrupting your sleep as well. So it, one of those areas to examine is sleep. Another is exercise. So I'm hearing, uh, I see some of you want to exercise and do more, but it's difficult to find the time or the money or the childcare. Um, but maybe there are ways you can do it with a friend or share responsibilities with others. So thinking about the area of exercise. Diet. Um, again, I saw people saying that they've had weight gain and other um, uh, ramifications around stress that may affect their diet. So eating regularly, uh, not eating at your desk if possible. So just taking, you know, 15 minutes and going somewhere else can be really helpful. I oftentimes say, you know, there should probably be a take back the lunch campaign at our, <laughs> some of our workplaces. Yeah. So you're welcome to take that and run with it. Uh -huh. um, so how can we take back the lunch? And then and take a look at your unhealthy habits. We all have them uh, to some form. Are you drinking too much coffee, too much caffeine? Are you smoking? Are you drinking excessively? And really try to monitor those unhealthy habits if you have any. And are you maintaining positive relationships? So research tells us time and time again how important these relationships are. And so these are some areas for you to look at and think about, but we're going to show you uh, an assessment. How well do you take care of yourself? So this is a self-care checklist. Now, everything that we're showing you today, we're going to upload these documents, but they're also in uh, some materials in our resources. Okay, so this is a personal self-care assessment tool. I have to tell you, I've been doing this with everybody in my office as well. So this is helpful no matter where you are or what you do to really think about your self-care and, and how you are use, utilizing self-care. And it's broken into categories. So I really like this. And what I really like about this, though, is that it can give you ideas of things to do. So physical self-care. And you can scroll. If for some reason you're not seeing a scroll down, you do have a scroll bar on the right-hand side. And you can scroll yourselves as well. Psychological self-care, so your mental health, make time for self-reflection. So you can go ahead, you can, not right now, but in your own time, uh, emotional self-care, you can 
fill this out and, and really get an idea of what you're doing well and then maybe some of those things that you want to do better at or what you want to do. Maybe you want to lift weights or practice martial arts or um, go see a, a counselor or write in a journal, whatever it is that you'd want that would be more helpful for you. And if and so time is a is an issue for for many of us as as you've said over and over again to be able to do some of those things. So what we really liked is if you only have a few minutes, right? So it only takes two minutes to stretch, daydream, breathe, doodle, say no to a new responsibility. That's huge. If you can say no no to a new responsibility, sometimes it only takes two minutes. Um, I know, give or take your your circumstances. Share a favorite joke, less than two minutes and you may feel better. If you have five minutes, having a cleansing cry, chat with a coworker, sing out loud, enjoy a snack. If you have 10 minutes, you could write in a journal, call a friend, meditate, draw a picture, dance. And if you have 30 minutes, which really is a luxury, I understand, you could maybe get a, a massage, exercise, read uh, some literature, you know, a book, a book, a novel, practice yoga, or watch your favorite show. So this is only if you have a few minutes. So time is an issue, it is. But if we break it into two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, it's, it, it could be doable to start to add some of these things into your day. Yeah, I think a big part of me when I when I started looking at this is really sort of a mind shift. That So we think, okay, so I'll go to the gym and exercise, but I need at least an hour or two to be able to do that. Um, and, and Or I need like a, an hour or so to go out or, or at least a couple hours to go out with friends or something. So we start putting sort of this mental block around the amount of time we have to have, but we never get two hours to ourselves. We never get an hour to ourselves. Mm -hmm. So then we just say, well, forget it, mm -hmm. and then we don't do it. The idea is can we take a, spe a step back and think about it this way? So if in the middle of the day you realize, God, I'm really not feeling well right now or I'm feeling really stressed out, can I just take two minutes in between clients? Um, for example, to breathe, to stretch, to just take a quick walk around the office, um, to look out the window. Is there to drink some water? You know, is there is there five minutes that I can do before the next staff meeting where I can sort of jot down some ideas or, or listen to some music? What are some things that you can start implementing throughout your day and sprinkling it throughout to help support you? And then. If you think about it, the more that you can do these couple minutes at a time, at the end of the day, you've probably done at least 30 minutes. At the end of the week, you could have done a couple hours of self-care mm -hmm. if you really kind of break it apart from having these set times. Great. Yeah. So I also we also want you to maybe identify one of those things that you can do and take away from today. Let's talk a little bit about self-awareness and the importance of self-awareness. So when we think about self-awareness, it's how do we have mindfulness of, over what we do, recognizing these early signs of stress, identifying our own strengths, again, because when we can focus on our strengths, uh, I think that really adds to our resiliency. Uh, and when have you felt particularly successful in your work? So really building this self-awareness. And we have a self-awareness assessment, again, a lot of tools, which I really like to use this with all sorts of people. I use it with students, clients, really thinking about yourself. And there's two components to this. There's a self-rating. So question one, for example, how self-confident are you? And you rate yourself with all of these. I think there, there are 12 items. So you rate yourself. And then you have two people that you care about, who care about you, and you have them rate you. And then you look at uh, people, you know, it can give you a good idea about how you see yourself and how others see you, which can be very helpful. It can help sort of also, uh, oftentimes we probably um, exaggerate a bit sort of how we handle certain situations, and it's possible that a friend can say, well, no, yeah, I think you actually handled that pretty well. It, it didn't look like you were having that much um, anxiety over it, or mm -hmm. it didn't look like you were having that much. So that also helps to kind of balance and gauge kind of yeah. our, our awareness. Um, and put things into perspective a little bit better. Um, so I think these are just some things to really kind of think about um, and, and consider about really focusing on those strengths. What are the things that we're doing well? When we're faced then with challenging situations, whether it's clients um, and issues that we're dealing with with clients, whether it's issues with other coworkers or with supervisors or even at home, I mean, I think a lot of these things do, do apply in, in all the different spheres that we function in. But let's think about problem solving and coping. So some questions to really think through and ask yourself. How can we build coping and problem solving for ourselves? Now, what do we do or don't do to make things worse during stressful times? So when we're stressed out, what do we do or don't do that makes things worse? Can we be doing things to make them better? And that sort of taps into the second question. What do we do or don't do to make things better during stressful times? You know, 
So if I'm particularly stressed out and I know I'm feeling stressed out and I'm not, I, I'm not actually taking that time to breathe, then I know I'm probably making things worse, right? Or if I'm really feeling stressed out about a situation and I'm, I'm uh, not finding some supports that I need, or some things to help alleviate it that maybe I've identified could be helpful for me, I'm probably making that situation worse. What can I do about it? So when, when you're thinking about coping with a situation, oftentimes we have situations in which we can do something about it um, and problem solve and, and figure out some solutions to things. But oftentimes there are certain situations that we're faced with that we may have to accept, that we really don't have a control over. And how can we use some coping to, to accept that, those situations as well? Um, um, how can we use problem solving to address the things that we can change? How do we use coping to address the things that we can't change? And oftentimes that is also even a helpful method that we utilize as clients that also is helpful in just in our own lives as well. And one thing that, that can be really helpful is to think about a mission statement. So, and a good place to start with the answer, with creating the mission statement, a personal mission statement, is thinking about why do you do the work you do? Why do you do this work? So if you can chat in your responses over to the right in the chat box, why do you do this work? And if you want to, you could write it down on a piece of paper and post it by your computer. It can be helpful as well. So why do you do this work? So as you're doing that, I'm just going to remind everybody that we're going to post. Uh, it's my calling and purpose. Sorry. <laughs> so as, as people are writing in, we're going to, uh, just as a reminder, we're going to post the slides, the handouts, the assessments, the recording, all on the CTACNY.com website. In addition to that, I think we'll find a stress thermometer. Somebody asked about a stress thermometer. We'll probably be able to find one and post it as well. It's my calling and purpose. It's rewarding to help and guide others. I'm good at what I do. I'm helpful. I'm organized, and people feel better after talking to me. I do this work to make a difference. This is satisfying work. It feels important. Excellent. Enjoy helping people, care about others, good at it, rewarding, because I want people to know that recovery is possible. I'm living proof of it. Excellent. It's my passion, my calling. I love the work. So these are really wonderful examples mm -hmm. of personal mission statements, and I think it's important to check in and, and do this on a regular basis to remind ourselves why we started doing this work, and that can help kind of ground us again. Um, especially in some of those frustrating times. And, and one tip could be is could you, could you type something up, a sentence or two, and post it somewhere, maybe on your computer or somewhere where you're going to see it that will help kind of be a, a remind you as to why you do this work on a regular basis. Because oftentimes when we're feeling, really feeling overwhelmed, we lose sight of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A couple others have come in and said um, it, it, it's challenging, but it's also a rewarding job. Um, you know, it's a very meaningful and satisfying job, and that I feel that I'm contributing to others and others are contributing to me, which is also a really great um, perspective as well. So these are really great examples of really thinking through, why do I do this work? And, and can we post that somewhere to help remind you on a regular basis? Now, Lydia was talking a little bit about c coping, and, I, and we've talked a little bit about mindfulness, and I wanted to just talk now with you about empathy. So empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. So I'm sure you all use empathy all the time. And how does empathy and, and how is it different from sympathy? So I want you to look at these two images of sympathy and empathy and tell me how they're different. So on the one side you have sympathy and, the, and they're hugging each other and they look a little different on empathy. The one is giving the other an, an umbrella to protect him or her from some, something outside. So how are they different? Sympathy has no boundaries, says Robin. Thank you. Do you see that? So emotional boundaries support objectivity and reduces over-involvement in clients' lives and your own distress. So empathy, sympathy may have no boundaries, but empathy does. Jackie says the two bodies are equal in proportion. Raquel says sympathy involves feelings of all the people involved, where empathy doesn't. Exactly. Sympathy uh, is you're involving everyone's feelings, but empathy, you're really only involving the other person's feelings. Sympathy is very draining, says Latasha. Many patients are looking for that, and it's been very hard to only offer empathy. Sympathy does not change the situation. With empathy, we stand under the same umbrella. It's more collaborative, mm -hmm. but also allows you to have sort of that objective. Um, so you're empathic, 
you're providing the support that they need, you're showing that compassion, you're attending to their needs, but you're doing it on an even, uh, on an even level but you're also doing it in a way that encourages sort of those emotional boundaries and keeps your objectivity in, in it. I think when we find ourselves being less objective is when it starts feeling very distressing, when it starts feeling overwhelming, and really puts us at risk for, for burnout um, uh, more seriously. So really thinking through how can we help support that? How can we maintain those emotional boundaries and support that objectivity? And that doesn't mean that we're, we're, we're distancing ourselves from our clients or that we're being cold about things. It's about sort of really thinking through how can we support people, how can we meet their needs, how can we understand where they're coming from, but be able to keep our own personal emotions um, uh, together um, and, and um, in a safe and a healthy way. Mm -hmm. And I think this is another great mm -hmm. sort of description. I think some of you already said this, which mm -hmm. is really wonderful. So how do you know if you have good emotional boundaries? So this is a really great depiction of what can often happen. So we may have so some people may be on the apathetic uh, sphere of things. And maybe especially if you're on the burnout side. Right? Yes, yeah. yes. But then there's empathy and then there's sympathy. And if you look at this image, you see the one person with an empathy has one foot in empathy and one foot in sympathy where he can help pull the person out who's, who's in sympathy. So often what happens, if we're using sympathy with our clients, we can fall in there with them. We're drowning with them. Basically, it comes down to. And so, using empathy and focusing on how we use empathy can be a really helpful coping mechanism, a protective factor, in the work that we do. So, take a minute. We're going to continue with um, some of these recommendations, but take a minute and chat with us. How do you know if you have some good emotional boundaries? What are some things that you do to keep those emotional boundaries? And keep submitting those to us. Um, so that we can um, uh, kind of hear some of the examples that you have and um, hear some of the examples that you have as we continue to talk about some strategies. And I think a key thing here, and I think it, this is across the board in all the kind of the work that we do and, and just as people being um, really about uh, us, us as human beings really revolve around relationships. And this idea is relationships really help when we're stressed out. That's social support. How can we build that social support both personally and professionally? And the stress can also strain relationships. So I think a common example here is that this idea, many of you already said this, is that your coping mechanism may be to go and hang out with friends, but then you don't feel you have time to. So you begin to start seeing friends less and less, and you start straining. Those relationships start um, becoming strained. So what can we do? What can we ask ourselves to continue to build those social support networks, people that can help support us in our health, in our well-being, that can identify for us um, when we're struggling and bring us back up? What can you do? Can you ask yourself, what am I doing to build relationships? Um, how am I expanding those support networks? Do you have friends you can speak with about how work affects you? Obviously, keeping confidentiality, but really thinking through how can, um, how it, professionally as well as personally, how can I find some support and maintain those relationships? How can I actively attend to some of those things? Um, once you have support, how can you activate them? How do you identify when you need help? So if, so if Kara is my social support, and I know that I can I can um, talk to her when I'm really stressed out, or she can, kind of knows me well enough to know to see when I'm stressed out, she can also indicate to me. So I say, Kara, you know, if you see me really kind of stressed out, you see me doing this, this, and this, let me know, because I may not see it myself. But she'll say, hey, she'll point it out right away. And then um, I also need to identify how can I ask for help because oftentimes asking for help is difficult. So having some of those discussions, using things like the Breathe Support Tool, which is going to be available to you, um, as well as we came across this handy tool that helps process some of that, activating the support and finding um, who would be the person you can turn to and um, having sort of a plan in place in which they can tell you when you're stressed out and how to support you back. And, you only, and if you only have a few minutes to maintain relationships, here are some key examples. Sometimes it's just sending a quick email or a text or message. That's like a minute or two. If you're a really fast texter, it's even shorter. You know, um, Saying goodbye or hello when you can come across people, post-it notes on the fridge, um, reconnecting with family as well, playing time, having time with our children, um, playing a game with them. It doesn't have to take a long period of time. The same thing that we said before, sometimes it's just a sprinkling of a few minutes um, a, a day or a couple times throughout the day that helps support some of those relationships. Workplace relationships help as well. So I, I'm sure many of you go to your colleagues or your supervisors. Um, going to people to kind of vent or help listen and provide you support 
um, uh, going to supervisors to help you with things you're, you're challenged with and supervisors going to each other or their supervisors uh, can be very helpful. But somebody did chat in that they don't really have anyone, that either people are below them or above them, and there's really no mutual colleague for them to go to. And I wanted to just point to you to this direction that there are other areas. There are a lot of virtual support groups out there, uh, professional groups and support groups um, that can be really helpful. Um, also, looking for others in similar professions. There are these meetups that happen for social workers and other types of professions that can be really helpful. But also remember confidentiality. We just want to point that out. Um, to share how you feel, but not your client's name or story. And if you're not able to find some, maybe you can create some. So maybe you can go across, so not necessarily just within your agency, but maybe across agencies or through a variety of different social support, um, social work networks or, or psychology networks or just mental health in general. How can we start reaching out parent mm -hmm. advocates if you're on, if you're on as well? You know, what are some things that we can do to support each other across settings? Um, and, and maybe it's just like a once a month like open meeting, or maybe it's a, a, a quarterly kind of opportunity to talk or meet up. Um, take some time to just chat in. How do you seek support from colleagues or supervisors? How have you utilized them before? Um, how do you ask for help? Please submit some of those suggestions and recommendations and we'll share those with others. And in the same way, if you only have a couple minutes Really, you can do some things within the workplace to build that. So respond to email that has been nagging you, have a conversation with someone who you don't usually work with, schedule team meetings, eating lunch, taking back that lunch is particularly important. So here are some examples of some strategies that you can implement, again, just a couple minutes throughout the day. But I do want to spend a couple minutes really thinking through managing your workload. So a lot of what today was was really sort of how you personally can find ways to take care of yourself and seek support. But I think there's one key aspect here is this managing your workload. It's, you know, can you, is there a way to manage the work? And I know we're all in these uh, sort of changing environment. The way that we're doing work may be shifting and fluctuating. The number of clients that we're seeing may be shifting as well. Um, can you vary your caseload? Can you see a variety of clients mixing milder and more intense cases? I know when I first started working, I had a number of intense cases and it became very overwhelming until I started talking with my supervisor and really figuring out how to manage so I had a mix of milder as well as intense cases, did I start feeling really much better about my job because I had a little bit more control over the caseload, but also that it wasn't so overwhelming on a constant basis. Um, can you schedule time for those administrative tasks so you're not staying late at work doing the paperwork? Um, can, is there a way to transition stagnant cases to other services, the cases that, where people aren't coming? And many of you also are in settings that you're putting in a variety of different uh, new models to help support and reduce no-shows um, and increase engagement. Some, some of that could be supported with some of this work. Um, have a transition time between seeing clients and going home at the end of the workday. Some of you said you read or listen to music. Uh, using that commute time, especially if, if you're in uh, New York City or New York City area, oftentimes there's a commute. If you're in other places, maybe you're, it's a long ride home or maybe it's a ride on a bus or a subway. What are some things that you can do during that ride to help transition you from the stress of work so that you're ready when you walk in the door at home that you can really also attend to your family? And maybe that's just reading or music or a quick exercise or a quick run. And really thinking through about keeping hope alive. How can we keep hope alive about the work that we're doing? And one thing about um, uh, uh, empathy and maintaining emotional boundaries is the idea of switching on and off. This is a little uh, pocket guide that you can use, and it's just really talking about that empathy and switching on and off and what you can do. And that switching on when you go to work is really a conscious process. So you can talk to yourself as you switch. You can use images where you're switching on. And as you switch on, all of your feelings that are yours stay with you. They don't go to anyone else. And you can also find rituals that help you switch as you start and stop. And then when you leave work, you can switch on where you go home and you can be cared for and you can feel your feelings and you connect with others. Um, and breathing slowly and deeply can help calm yourself down when starting a tough job. So this is really handy. People love this. We love it. And you can print it out and fold it and put it in your pocket as a reminder. Also those tips, 10 things to do for each day. So knowing that we do the switching on and off process, but maybe we can start to practice it a little, a little differently. Yeah. And, you know, this webinar was uh, scheduled, it's a Lunch and Learn webinar series because these webinars are really opportunities to build our own sort of support and training and our clinical knowledge, and we do these periodically on a monthly basis. So this is really for you, um, although we recognize that there are probably some agencies who probably recommend or, or highly encourage or maybe even require 
of those to participate. But this is an opportunity for you as clinicians to kind of pick up some additional skills to support you or knowledge to support you in the work that you're doing. And that also is a good actually transition point to thinking through becoming a resilient organization. And I think the challenge that we have is oftentimes we say, well, you know, as an individual, am I resilient enough? But oftentimes we, we can't really separate ourselves from the work environment. And that there's here's a list of a number of warning signs that we actually, it isn't just me. So it's actually all my colleagues, or it's the whole workplace in general, especially if there's a lot of staff turnover, absences, poor communication, a lot of missed deadlines, incomplete work, poor quality of work and service. It is possible that we are actually in an organ in an, in um, uh, an organization that's experiencing um, widespread stress. So this is something that we're going to share with you as well as an organizational self checklist um, that you can, um, uh, and I'm just going to show it real quick. Um, that you can take back and utilize yourself or with your colleagues or supervisors and really think through what can we do in a workplace as a whole um, to really attend to some of these things. What are some simple strategies that we can start doing right away? For example, can we do a self-care check-in at every staff meeting? Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about more about that in our second webinar. We're also going to give you the professional quality of life scale, which is that scale that I mentioned to you that assesses compassion fatigue, satisfaction, uh, burnout, secondary trauma, and you can really utilize it as a resilience planning tool, both individually, just for you yourself as a self-assessment, organizationally it can be used across coworkers, or just between you and your supervisor and supervision to help guide you in addressing some of these things. So it isn't just you taking charge, but also that as a workplace we're in a, in a more healthy environment. I want you to identify one thing that you can start doing right away. So one thing that you can do personally, one thing you can do in the workplace right away. We gave you lots of examples. If you have two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes. So pick one thing that you're going to focus on and, and try to do within the next week or a few weeks um, to try to take better care of yourself. And you can chat yourself. some of those in if you have some time. And I know some of you have already started chatting in that you will try to find some time to spend more time with friends or to listen to music or use that commuting time to, to support you. So thank you for submitting those. This is something that we found, Six Habits of Happiness Worth Cultivating. We printed this out and put it in our office. Maybe you could do the same if you like it. Pay attention, keep friends close, get thanks, get moving, drop grudges, uh, practice kindness. These are six habits of happiness that you can practice and cultivate. Thank you so much for being here with us today. We're going to show you a, free re a few resources. Yeah, so what we're going to do is show you, uh, there's a couple of web links as well as other self-care kits and things. So we've given you a variety of recommendations and resources. You Maybe you won't use all of those, but maybe you'll use some of them. Um, maybe some will work for you and your colleague will like others. So we recommend just giving a variety of different options and really just taking the time to kind of think through what can I do to, to support me and my work. And some of you are said, you know, I'm just going to focus on starting to take lunch right away. Um, as an example. Here are a number of the references. Our next Lunch and Learn is on workforce, is a part two for the workforce resilience and it's on enhancing supervision supporting our workforce. That'll be particularly helpful for supervisors, but I think also for line staff to really help um, uh, make supervision as helpful as possible. So it's, I think it's helpful for everybody. Um, and I know we've answered a number of questions throughout the webinar. I guess there's some, also some closing points that seems to have come in that we yeah, want to Yeah, I just wanted to end on this note, Mary. Thank you so much for this reminder to ask for help. So Mary shared with us that she had been asking for help since she came, and she uh, asked for help from supervisors, the colleagues, and then she also uh, gives help and is, makes herself available. So that's really that's inspiring. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you again for participating, everyone. We hope you have a wonderful day. And feel free to contact us if you have any questions or concerns. So again, you can go to www.ctacny.com and access the slides, the webinar recording, and all the handouts. And, and um, you also have the PDF. So you have all those recommendations for a couple minutes to, to check in. Um, and take that out, print them. Bring it to the staff meeting. Um, use them as self-assessments. We highly, highly encourage you to take this back and talk through with your coworkers some ideas for how to implement and, and move forward. Here are our emails. Feel free to reach us directly. And thank you, everybody, for participating. Have a wonderful, restful day. Bye-bye.